So I'm great. And uh, Tony has the pleasure of introducing you this morning. Lovely. Okay, Thank so uh, maybe I should just go away because I could take the whole hour to do this because Dave sent me a CV and it's enormous. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so that's all right. Dave, Dave Albers is the speaker today then. Um, he started out in the University of Wisconsin doing uh, math and physics as his undergraduate. And by the time he did his PhD, he was a physicist. Um, he's then done postdocs at... Uh, UC Davis, Max Planck in Leipzig, and then Columbia University, where he uh, eventually became an assistant professor. You were a postdoc for over 10 years, uh, Dave. That sounds scary to me. Yeah, although um, it wasn't really uh, the um, at Columbia because they're so f complicated, the scientist is effectively an assistant professor. Okay. So okay, uh, so, 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 it, so right. nicer than it looked. Anyway, uh, since 2018, he's been associate professor in the uh, informatics and data science section in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado. Um, his research is in physiological modeling and inference, I'd say, using lots of data simulation, machine learning, and math physiology. He's published over 50 papers. He has an enormously long list of collaborators you can see there. And um, I think we can let him uh, use yeah. his hour to tell us more details about what he's been working on. So, um, okay. Dave. Awesome. So can you see, you see this? Uh, we can I see, see it quite small. But we can yeah, see okay. it. Yeah, Let you might see. want to go to full screen. Yeah. And I guess actually we could ask: Do you uh, do you want to keep questions for the end, or? Um, how do I mean, you... it's up to you guys, really. You can people can yell out, and I'm. Okay. Or they can put happy. them. You can put your questions in the chat also, if you would like to uh, ask. Uh, ask something along the way. Awesome. All right. So I just want to acknowledge really quick my uh, collaborators in no order because there's a uh, lot of work. And um, it's, you know, so George, Matt, Melika, Andrew, J uh, Jamie, Lena, um, Noemi, Nigo, Erica, Henry, Jan, Bruce, Will, Tell, Peter, Mark, Brad, Aline, Christine, Artie, June, Cecilia, Christ another Christine, Melanie, Jake, Depak, Yanron, Carolyn, and Barkov. The, it's sort of a mix of um, computer scientists, a bunch of um, MDs, um, engineers, all kinds of people are kind of all over the place. Um, so just, uh, I'm going to be preachy for a second because this is kind of a math, uh, group. So generally, in my opinion, we, we work on systems physiology to understand systems physiology. So to do that, that means that we have to work with data in some sense, or we want to enforce the discipline of, of, uh, evaluating our models with data. Human data, human system physiology data, it mostly exists in a clinical context because um, we generally don't measure people um, unless we absolutely have to, um, which means that it's a mix of generating processes. Um, there's a physiology disease and healthcare process, which we'll talk about in a bit. So to get human data, usually you have to work within somebody that's doing applications. So you have to give them something of value to have them, uh, to allow them to work with you. Um, but it also helps you with a picking mechanism for what problems to work on. The clinicians can tell you which problems are the most dire and which will uh, save the most lives. So it, it helps us, it helps guide what problems to work on. Um, generally in, uh, in mathematics, we have kind of an imagine, there's often an imagined data problem um, where people will imagine what data we might have or imagine what the world would be like with data. Um, and then invent um, very, very complicated systems physiologic models that have no hope of ever being evaluated. Um, while this is a thing that I don't want to tell people exactly not to do, I would encourage you to not do it because it pushes us into a world of, you know, we have 15 different glucose insulin models. We have no idea of how to differentiate them or even understand them. So this is one sort of issue. Another issue that shows up um, that sometimes I'll get reviews from mathematicians um, ironically with uh, clinicians on the paper uh, as authors, as they'll say, well, I can imagine clinicians might want this, or maybe clinicians might want that piece of information. What's better is to just talk to the clinicians and find out what they want, because <laughs> um, it's very difficult to predict. For example, because uh, my training is in mathematics, I have, I've been 
surprised so many times about what they care about and what they don't. So what lives in our imagination and what lives in reality is, is, um, uh, are, is often different, uh, but there's a really easy way to, to solve that. Just collaborate with people and talk to people um, and to evaluate with data. So that's my little bit for, um, so if you wanna work in this world and have an impact, generally um, there's a pipeline for doing that. Uh, so we live in this knowledge creation space where we are inventing methods and models to try to understand in, um, the world. Um, but generally there's a whole there's a whole pipeline that we have to plug into to be sort of relevant. So the data sources are extremely complicated. Um, before I started this work, I had no idea how ridiculously complicated it is to describe human physiology and the human system and uh, human disease. But if you want an idea, there's a thing called, uh, to get some feeling, there's a, there's a book called the ICD-10, the book IC, ICD-9 or ICD-10 that calculates or uh, captures just the billing codes for hospitals. And the book is thousands and thousands of pages long. And this is just billing codes. This has nothing to do with, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very gross um, and coarse uh, description. So getting the data out into a usable form and munging it and fixing it is a big process that you have to plug into because you have to understand what gets pulled out and, and how. And then we use that data to evaluate our models. But of course, we have to understand that process at least some. And then the piece that usually is the failure point for applications is the knowledge translation, translation piece. Um, you can see that with Fitbit, right? Fitbit is, they, they have this huge problem where um, they can get people to buy their device, but they can't keep pe people to keep using it. And that's often because their translation of information is not very good. So for example, in uh, the case of um, most people trying to manage their bodies or their weight or something, um, Fitbit kind of go has the like, go, you can go, you had a bad week, but next week will be great. Most people, when they have a bad week, don't want to hear about their week being bad. So they just turn the device off. So there's a ton of work that's human computer action with computer scientists. And then that work bridges into the, into the final piece, the deployment piece. So usually to have an impact, you want to try to sew together as many pieces of this team as you can, as you can. Um, so um, the big themes for the day are because uh, we're focusing more on mathematical methods, um, uh, the sparsity of the data um, really um, constrain our models and our inference structure. Um, and that will also expose the age old uh, dynamics uh, misfit problem, um, which was around, I know when I, in the, in the eighties and nineties, um, but people have kind of, are just starting to refocus on it. And I'll show you a, a horrific example of it. Um, human physiologic data are generally created by many processes. And we'll kind of talk about that a bit and we'll show how to model it. Um, Adding uh, reality to the modeling eff efforts is very, it's ugly sometimes and complicated, but it also leads to more rich and often interesting models. Um, and finally, uh, the discipline of, evol of uh, evaluating with realistic data, I think is at least a lot of new impactful problems. So today I'm gonna focus on ICU glycemic management and, and ventilation, mechanical uh, ventilation. Um, we work in traumatic brain injury, human uh, female endocrine um, type 2 diabetes ma self management. Um, but today we're going to kind of try to stick in the ICU a little bit. So, again, the data uh, that we have ha are generated by three processes physiology, disease processes, and healthcare. So, we're going to spend a lot of time on the other processes. So, um, let's just talk about healthcare for a second. So, we have the environment that kind of generates the initial patient state. But then when the patient enters the hospital and, or uh, care setting and gets measured, all of these other processes are generating what happens to the patient. So the care team does things to the patient. There are, there are interventions that move the patient's state around, drugs that they give the patient, uh, machines they put the patient on. Um, there are the tests that they measure the patient from, which are in some sense objective, but they're confounded by the um, the, uh, the therapy and all of this information gets plugged into the health record that goes back to the care team that then amends how they how they deal with the patient. Um, so all of these pieces are healthcare process pieces, which you can think of as a large, complicated stochastic process. Hopefully not super stochastic, but at any rate. Um, so at any rate, that's that's kind of a high level of a uh, uh, quick bit on how to how to think about the data. 
So now let's talk about um, very briefly data assimilation and a bit of machine learning. So data assimilation is in some sense uh, machine learning for mechanistic physiologic models, which is mostly what we're going to be working on today. Um, so the way that this works, we take patient data, whatever the relevant patient data is for the, for the model, and then we might have a couple of different inference methods, a state parameter and a, and a, a parameter filter. Um, or excuse me, a parameter and state filters that will infer the states and the parameters of the ODEs or the whatever model you have, PDEs, um, which then kicks out a distribution of, uh, of estimates for states and parameters that um, goes forward until you find a new data point and then you do the inference again. Um, so it's broadly defined as a regression. It forecasts states and parameters in real time. There are also formulations that are variational. So you, more like optimization where you take a chunk of data and you do the, and you, uh, you do the inference over that um, finite time window. Um, at any rate, this is more or less with data assimilation, how data, you can think of data assimilation. Um, it has three components or three levers. There's the model, there's the inference machinery, and then there's the evaluation metrics. So in some sense, you can think of data assimilation as a model inference pair, and you can have the same model in many types of inference or many types of models and um, many models in one kind of inference, uh, one inference method. So at any rate, we usually want to pick or select which one is a, one of these is the best. And we use this, uh, we use evaluation metrics to try to do this. I'll discuss the mathematical models of physiology when we get to the applications. But there is a big problem floating around, which is um, the models are almost never identifiable. Um, they're usually too complicated to calculate structural identifiability problems. Um, if you don't know what that word means, it's, it's really whether you can solve for the parameters uniquely or not, even under, even under perfect uh, data conditions. And generally, the models uh, have coupled parameters that are redundant because physiology has a lot of coupled processes that are redundant. So there's no way we, we can really remove a lot of the structural identifiability problems because in some sense, physiology is not structurally identifiable because there's so much redundancy. So um, to get around this, we have to have methods of selecting subsets of parameters to estimate. So there are sort of three different ways that you can do it. You can use knowledge, you can use machine learning, or you can use some combination of, the bo of both. Um, generally, that third option is what uh, ends up working the best. Um, the machine learning can give you kind of a rank ordered um, uh, importance of parameters, which is really helpful, but often you want to infer particular pe um, pieces of information. Um, and you also, you often know the model, so you know, yeah, this parameter is impossible to deal with, and um, these four parameters are the parameters we care about. Um, so inference machine, inference machine we're going to use today, we're going to use, there are many methods we're going to use, um, iterative predictor correctors. Um, so ensemble common filters and a novel ensemble, a constrained ensemble common filter. Um, we, I think that there's a little bit of unscented common filter. So the real difference between these methods, the, uh, the common filters, the nonlinear common filters work in the following way. You have data and then you have some way of, uh, of defining a distribution around the data. Um, uh, the unscented filter has a simplex, the ensemble common filter is a Gaussian distribution. And then what happens is you take that, that distribution you push it through the nonlinear model, which, which tells you where the ensemble goes in the future. You encounter data, and then you invoke a, a, a sort of the standard common filter um, inference structure for renormalizing or resetting that ensemble to synchronize it with the data. And at that, it's at that point that you infer states and parameters in some sense. Um, so at any rate, these are just different uh, methods for doing that. The, the way that the constraints work, um, if the mo if during that update step, if when the, the common filter is invoked, um, you can set boundaries as to where you want certain states or parameters to live. And, and if they live outside of that, you can, outside of that region, you can invoke a quadratic program to put the parameters in that region. And that's more or less how you constrain the common filter um, or the uh, ensemble common filter. So we'll also use a bit of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and some deterministic methods. Um, which are very sort of the very standard optimization bits. Um, finally, the, just I'm going to briefly mention model error. Um, model error, of course, is the difference between the system and the model, um, which is uh, the sort of the functional model error. And then there's the error because the parameter estimates aren't optimized. So um, uh, error between forecasts and predictions. Um, there doesn't exist a global notion of best. 
And generally the different metrics will give you different answers for which DA model pair um, perform, uh, uh, performs the best. And we'll see some examples of this. Um, today, we're just gonna deal with um, mean square between forecasts and measurements, a little bit of KL divergence um, for distributional errors and uh, linear correlation. All right, so let's get to the action. So uh, glycemic management in the ICU is important because it, uh, it impacts outcomes. It's, it's difficult, it has a fairly low success rate. Um, something like 20% of people have a hypoglycemic uh, event during an ICU stay. Um, generally, so hypoglycemia is low, hyperglycemia is high. Hyperglycemia slowly mangles your system, your vascular system. Hypoglycemia kills you very quickly. So if you go hypoglycemic, they ha the nurses have to take a very fast intervention. It's not exactly like a heart attack, but similar. It's an emergency where they shoot about a, a coax with the sugar in your system to keep you from dying. So they're really worried about hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia um, sort of drives negative outcomes. So it's very time consuming. Um, the patients are very non-stationary. Non -stationary, um, they start, they start, they enter the ICU kind of, you know, sort of sick. They get usually get very sick and then they leave uh, well enough to, uh, hopefully they leave well enough to um, move to the floor. So they, they change relatively quickly. Um, the management is very person independent and ICU independent. Different ICUs have different protocols because they're managing different conditions. There are of course many different kinds of like, you know, big hospitals maybe have 10 different ICUs. Um, so, uh, and generally we don't know why uh, people have dysglycemia in the ICU. Um, so, um, so some, some just uh, from the get-go, some key mathematical takeaways, the data, we will see how the data limitations constrain a uh, model construction and evaluation um, and drive severe inference problems with identifiability and ill-posedness. Um, we're gonna see the dynamics misfit problem. Um, and, uh, and we're also gonna see how different application areas, um, dynamics, the same modeling framework and um, can have different implications in different application areas. Um, so most people in the ICU need glycemic management, even though most people don't need it outside of the ICU. Um, generally, the, 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 and nobody knows why. Um, the data are sparse, so less than like an hour of uh, um, a measurement, even though the, the oscillations are order minutes, so periods are below an hour. Um, the clinical goals are generally intervals, which I'll show you. So the mean doesn't matter exactly. They're not trying to hit a mean, but they're really trying to, under, they're really trying to keep you in a, in a bounded region. Um, so why is it hard to manage uh, glucose in the ICU? So in a, the outpatient setting, if you eat a Snickers bar, your glycemic system, your, in, your endocrine system deals with uh, or has dynamics effectively of a, a damp driven oscillator. You eat something, it drives an oscillation, and you go back to homeostasis. Uh, when you continuously feed somebody, it, 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 dry, it makes a noisy periodic orbit. So you can see these are um, glucose and insulin um, oscillations. They're roughly out of phase a little bit. So it's a, it's a delayed, time delayed system in some sense. Um, so, this, so if you, you can imagine that measuring somebody every hour on a system that has frequencies that um, are present in the 15 minute to 30 minute range, um, we're not measuring people fast enough to really resolve them. And so it's very difficult to, to have some idea of what the boundaries for their oscillations are. Um, especially given the fact that they're, that they're changing. Um, on top of this, um, there are a lot of external variables that are moving people's uh, glycemic uh, homeostasis around. So they give drugs that move it around. And also because most people don't take insulin, it's very difficult to know how different insulins will affect them. And you have to realize that there, you know, there's four classes of insulin and dozens of different types. And so knowing how, when you give it somebody insulin, how they're going to behave is very difficult to predict, given the fact that most people aren't taking it. So what often happens is they'll give an insulin and the person will crash because um, they just are very reactive to a particular kind of insulin. So at any rate, that's more or less why. Um, so to give you an idea of what clinicians have to try to manage people, it's literally this piece of paper, or um, this is a you know, a snapshot of this piece of paper, they have a goal and then um, they have this table that tells them how to deliver insulin given uh, what their current measurements are. 
So this is the New York Presbyterian Hospital um, protocol. Other hospitals have other, pro other kinds of protocols um, or other protocols, but they all roughly look like this. Um, you can imagine, and then there are different protocols for different situations. It's effectively, you can write it out as a linear controller, but this is what they use. So the nurses and, 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 um, and uh, pharmacists are looking at this piece of paper and then they're changing people's doses. Um, so you can imagine that it's difficult and uncomfortable um, and takes a lot of time. So this is sort of state of the art, what people do at the best hospitals in the world. Um, so, uh, so you can imagine, so armed with very few data points uh, and a very non-stationary system with a lot of external drivers, it's very difficult to manage people's glucose. This is why people, 20% uh, of people have a hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic event. And generally they're not very, they're not very successful at managing glucose. This was, it turns out particularly bad during COVID um, uh, because dysglycemia has just been unbelievably bad with people that have severe COVID because COVID is mashing your endothelial functions or your, your muscular and, and your um, vascular system. And so um, because of this, um, apparently glycemic management, people have said they've spent a, just a ton of time trying to keep people from dying just from glucose management, um, which is crazy. But at any rate, and also we're going to end up with a, probably a lot of people that have diabetes after this because it's doing so much vascular damage, but that's a story for another time. Um, all right. So the data we're going to, we're going to work with today, we have the blood glucose measurements, insulin, either IV or drip. We're not going to differentiate the kinds of insulin for right now, because that's a different uh, ball of wax that we can talk about at a different time. And then nutrition, um, and we're only going to talk about tube fed nutrition. Of course, there are like 10 kinds of tube feed nutrition and things like this, but just imagine food going into the gut. Um, so that's what we're working with. So the model, the model that we're going to start with, or the model that I'm going to talk about today is, is a, a compartmental glucose insulin model called the uh, Altridian model. It resolves, it was the first model that was able to resolve higher frequency glucose oscillations. It's a three compartment compartment model. It has plasma glucose, uh, remote insulin, which is interstitial insulin, not in your veins, and then insulin in your blood. Um, so it, it's six ODEs, but really it's three plus a delay filter. So it's an approximation in some sense of a, de of a delay dynamical system, but it's an ODE system. Um, so this is effectively, in some sense, a, um, uh, 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 what's the right, um, like a finite difference approximation of delay. And then we have glucose, insulin, uh, interstitial insulin, and plasma insulin. So the system is, the states are structurally identifiable. Um, the parameters are generally not given data. Um, and so uh, um, we have to kind of cope with that. But at any rate, this is kind of the picture. Also, a little bit of insight, something I didn't know when I started out. Um, I thought that there was some kind of deep insight into where these models come from. And what really happens is somebody sits down and they draw a picture, this picture, where they just circle, uh, this is state one, circle, state two. And then they start drawing lines between them and then try to um, uh, um, uh, those, those the lines end up being functional forms between these states. And that's really about all. So there isn't some deep on high knowledge. There's no first principles. This is just what, uh, what we got. So um, this is kind of where it, uh, where it starts. So um, again, six state, uh, Ultridian, um, UKF, or a CNKF and ENKF. So here's an example of it working in a person. The gray is the, is the ensemble. Um, the X's are the data points and the, um, the blue is the mean, oscillating mean. So that's what the model thinks is happening. And we can see with this person that within a day, we're entrained to the person pretty well. And after many days, we're still moving around and it's behaving really well and we're capturing all their glucose values and it's great. So here we can see it working, which is great. The only problem is it only works within about 40 to 60% of patients. Um, so, and in particular, it often doesn't work with patients that are difficult. So let's see, um, so why does it not work? So we never measure plasma insulin. Nobody ever does, except in research settings. Um, we cannot measure any parameters. We only measure one state and the input drivers. So the nutrition and the insulin that goes into the person. Measurement frequencies far below the frequencies we resolve generally. Um, 
And uh, there are many uh, healthcare process features that are affecting the situation. So um, if we just focus on identifiability, um, here we have blood glucose and we see a person that's kind of failing and it, the model eventually entrains to them after about four and a half days. Um, but what we can see is, is that without any constraints, the model thinks for the first four and a half days that the person is effectively dead. Their glucose is like 20 or five or something like this. And it's doing that because it thinks that the plasma insulin is around uh, 1200, which is not a thing that can happen to a person. So um, we can see effectively that eventually it, it after four and a half or five days, it uh, entrains to the person four and a half, five days is way too late. We really need it within 12 to 24 hours. Um, so, and this is happening because we're not measuring insulin. So uh, if we constrain the system, um, which doesn't mean that the, that the forward model can't have insulin values that are uh, ridiculous. It means that the, the update step makes sure that the model um, lies within the bounded region. We get it to entrain within about a day and a half, which is a substantial gain. And moreover, as we go, this is out you know, five or six days, um, it does a pretty good job of capturing the, the dynamics. And you can see that there, we have lots of oscillatory solutions which is um, the oscillations are slow, but they're, they're moving around and that's gonna be important in a second. But at any rate, it seems like it works. And actually, if we use this, it, it captures more like 80% of people. Um, and here we can see the constraints working. Um, at the beginning, they have to constrain the insulins and then after about the first you know, 10 or 20 data points, um, it entrains to the person. So that's very interesting. It feels like this is an initialization problem. So what, when we encountered this, we said, oh, okay, well, if we just initialize, if we just use optimization to initialize in the first, you know, 20 data points or something like this, um, just like the, the constrained uh, filter um, worked on, we'd say, okay, great. Then it'll, we'll, just in, we'll just set the model up so that it, it has the people in the right, uh, the parameters in the right place at the beginning, and, and this will be fine. Um, it turns out that this works uh, really terribly, as I'm going to show you in a minute. So um, the pro, uh, so and it really exposes the old dynamics misfit problem, which is that we can minimize some some optimization criteria like mean square error, and we can still miss and and that optimal solution can have very different dynamics than the generating system, and this is particularly bad when we have sparse data. Um, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to take the first twenty data points and we're going to do just a regular optimization. And we're going to start that optimization a hundred different at a hundred different um, sort of initial conditions, so that we can try to get the really the best solution, and then we're going to run the ENKF and the CNKF forward after that. So what happens, what you'll see here, if you look, is that it destroys all of the solution, destroys all of the op, all of the oscillations. So it it finds a solution that gets the glucose mean in the right place, but it gets the glucose dynamics completely wrong. Okay, so effectively what it does is it drives the, the, the model into uh, a fixed point solution. And what you're seeing is, is that um, this distribution here is just all of the different fixed points that the model, that the ensemble is finding or that the ensemble is in. So um, effectively what we did was we found a, a solution that was good for the mean and was terrible for the dynamics. And we can see this in the evaluation, the mean square error for the optimization solution is about a third of the ensemble Kalman, or the constrained ensemble Kalman filter. But also we can see that the distribution is very wrong. And in particular for clinicians, it's a big deal because the, the support of the invariant measure is very narrow compared to what we actually observe and what and compared to what uh, the, the first constrained case happened. Uh, and actually you could think, well, maybe we could have constraints that would save us so we can, we do the optimization, we constrain the thing, uh, in such a way that we get the dynamics back. The problem is, is that we don't know where the dynamics live inherently. So we don't really know what the right um, uh, pieces are. And actually it, um, when we run the optimization with the CNKF, it, it's even, it, it ends up being behaving much, much worse. So here again, you can see that the dynamics are, um, now the variance is kind of even, it's, it's worse, but we still just have the fixed points. We never find the oscillatory site, uh, solutions again. And here, um, the actually even the mean square error is worse. So doing the initial optimization to try to seed the model with the right parameters for the person ended up with a much worse solution generally. So now we're kind of stuck in some sense where, um, well, we're, 
Um, this is the end of this story for this model. Um, but what it suggests is kind of a deep mathematical problem that's floating around in the background. So um, the Kalman filter and optimization techniques generally solve, uh, they, they try to um, minimize the error relative to the, to the conditional mean of the data, right? And with sparse data, this is difficult. So you can imagine what you might really like is some kind of a Shannon sampling theorem that establishes when uh, the nonlinear filters will beat or be productive, will be productive to use compared to the linear filters. Um, so such a theorem doesn't exist. As far as I know, no one knows how to prove it or even set it up. We can state it. Um, but at any rate, it would be very useful to know, given um, uh, sampling, uh, when it would be useful to try a nonlinear filter versus just optimization or something like this. Um, so uh, another option, which you're not going to talk about today, which is generally the option that seems to be working, is to integrate data simulation with machine learning. Um, to deal with the dynamics misfit. So um, this is a, it, it's sort of the direction that most people I think are going. Um, I'm just not gonna talk about it today. Um, so now I just like to talk a little bit about rank one dynamics in this context. So and rank one dynamics. Sorry, is it possible to ask questions? You sure. Okay, uh, just a couple of things. Um, now with the, uh, uh, with this model that you presented, I mean, I, that, the, the, the questions are twofold. The first one is, um, why don't you restrict your uh, optimization to the regimes where you observe uh, uh, oscillatory behavior? So you actually analyze the model on its own. And yeah, so that's, it's okay. really hard to know that regime. It's really hard to know those regimes because you have 30 parameters or something. And but so- it's a six dimensional model. Shouldn't you be able to at least maybe numerically even uh, determine what uh, what these parameter regimes are? And it's hard. I mean, you have, Literally, you have um, something in the order like twenty-three parameters, and so um, it's hard to sort through that twenty-three per dimensional parameter space, and uh, and find there are many oscillatory regimes that are disjoint from other oscillatory regimes. Okay, so and the other question is, I mean, insulin is not only governed by the well, the glucose rather, sorry, in, uh, the interaction between insulin and glucose. Um, I mean, there are other hormones that are released like uh, glucagon, uh, somatostatin, and uh, there's an entire network of interaction that is involved. Shouldn't that be actually taken into account as well? Yes, yeah, so, okay, right. So this is great. So um, we beat on models that have those features, um, but here's the problem. We don't measure any of them. And so in some sense, one direction to go, which we've, which we've pushed on um, and mathematical physiologists um, fight back is we've gotten rid of insulin altogether and just had a stochastic differential equation where we're modeling glucose. So we, we go even in the opposite direction of what you're asking for. And the reason why is because um, what we see right now is the one of the big inference problems and the model validation problem is we're missing data to, uh, to, to validate. And if you add glucagon, which is a fine thing to do, um, now we have a full. Now we have a bunch more states that we also can't that are free states that we can't validate or control in any way. So it makes the inference problem infinitely more difficult, and we we can't validate the model in any way. We have no idea if if our um, glucagon mechanisms are correct or not. So this is the problem with doing that. So it's not that we don't. Um, I mean, we. I have. I'm part of collaborations where we are building more model, more sophisticated models that include those features. It's just that we have no idea. We have no way of verifying them, or validating them, and we can't use them because we can't connect them to data, and they're effectively free variables that can drive the system into almost any state you want it to. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. But I mean, just one thing. I know that uh, there are a few few people that are working on this dual um, dual system where you uh, you analyze in real time and apply optimal control to control glucagon as as well as insulin. Um, uh, you know, they, they design these pumps that 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 yes, so that's for both of these things. So I, I thought that 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 problem is kind of approachable to some extent. Yes, so that's with type one diabetes. Yes, that's correct, exactly. Yeah, so type one diabetes, the body produces no insulin. So you know all the insulin that's in the body because it's all it's only what you pump in. 
So that's a massively simple problem compared to the type two diabetes and type two diabetes is simple compared to the ICU. I see, I see, okay, thank you. So yeah, no, I mean, that's where we'd like to go. It's just that we have, um, it's complicated. So, um, so here I'm just gonna show you a little bit of rank one uh, dynamics, which is a very cool um, bit that factors into some clinical analysis and some surprising ways. So rank one was a theory that was in, um, come up with by Lai Seng Yang at Courant. And effectively what it's a, it's a brand of uh, dynamics where um, if the model has in it someplace, some notion of shear, um, there's a kind of stability where you can kick the model and it can leave a normal, uh, say a periodic orbit and it can move into a chaotic regime. So um, here's a sort of a picture of what, um, what might happen. So here you have the invariant measure uh, would be the, the, um, the red. And in normal case without shear, you kick the system and it will relax to its, its normal invariant orbit or its normal periodic orbit. And if there's shear, what can happen is when you kick it, it can drive, it can create folds that if you continue to kick it in certain ways under certain conditions, you can end up with a chaotic invariant measure. So it relaxes to, um, to a, a absolute continuous attractor. So, um, or a, a tractor with absolute continuous invariant measure. So this problem, it shows, uh, it just so happens that in the glucose insulin system um, that there's a delay induced uncertainty or the shear is in the delay. And we end up being able to observe this kind of uncertainty. Okay, so the, the, the point of this, of rank one in some sense is that the timing of the perturbations can drastically impact the dynamics. So a bunch of kick perturbations don't do anything. It will, it, it's, they're not strong enough or they're not, they're not happening in the right way with the right timing to induce the folds. Um, and you can imagine that scientifically this, this, has, this can wreak havoc because now you have a reproducibility problem where cause and effect kind of um, aren't consistent anymore. Um, so, so in the glucose insulin system, the shear is embedded in the time delay. So it's it, here, it's the, the delayed response of the liver. Um, the shear, we haven't computed exactly where the shear is, but um, we're, while well, we're in the process of computing where the shear is, and Lysang more or less gives a, a, a recipe for doing this, where you end up with a, where the shear is a function of the parameters. Um, so you, you can calculate this in certain circumstances and this model allows us to do that. Um, there is the outstanding problem of how rank one would work with delay dynamical systems generally, because that is, um, that's in function space rather than in, uh, in uh, regular ODE uh, parameter space. So um, this is a really nice on, uh, ongoing mathematical problem that um, Will and I are trying to get at, but at any rate. So here, what we can see is when we kick uh, with different time intervals, um, and this, uh, this is with uh, nutrition, but it doesn't matter if you kick with nutrition or food, um, you end up with uh, um, in, in a lot of, uh, with the gap uh, or time intervals for a lot of different time intervals, you end up relaxing to a, to a chaotic attractor. Um, so that what that effectively means is, is that this, this um, process is, is present for a lot of different kick uh, intervals. It also works for Poisson kicks. In other words, it's not very sensitive to how you kick the system. Um, additionally, uh, kick amplitudes um, for a wide variety of kick amplitudes, you observe um, delay induced uncertainty, meaning that this, this phenomenon is probably present in, uh, in, if the model is in any way representative of the system, this phenomenon is probably present in the ICU. So does that, uh, is that bad? So here we, and here we can actually see it happening. So you could ask yourself, is that bad? Um, how are clinicians going to feel about this? And your initial feeling would be that a, a chaotic orbit would be worse. However, as you see here, when we induce the chaotic orbit, um, not only do you effectively you get a more robust orbit, but the boundary the, or the support uh, the, uh, boundary, the, the boundaries of the um, support of the invariant measure are more narrow. So you actually, for, from a clinical standpoint, you want to induce chaos as soon as you can because you get an easier to manage system in some sense. It's more stable, it's more narrow, and it behaves in ways that you that are that are effectively good for you. So this was a surprise to us. Um, now uh, the problem is is that um, if you apply the same situation in a type two diabetes management setting, you get exactly the opposite result 
it ends up making the system much more difficult to manage. So in the ICU, you might want to induce chaos, or you might want to effectively randomize your protocol a bit. And in the and in a um, in a type two management setting, this is going to make management almost hopelessly complicated. It might actually end up being an argument for why we would give people with type two diabetes a continuous glucose monitor, um, because effectively what it would mean is is that finger stick measurements are um, if this phenomena is present in those systems, it would mean that finger stick measurements are never going to be able to be useful for self management, because um, Effectively, you kick the system and the oscillations decay for a long, long period of time. So um, now I'm going to switch gears to mechanical uh, ventilation just really quick. Um, so some, some, piece, some takeaways. Here's where we're really going to see the, um, the healthcare process because me the mechanical ventilator is, uh, is a healthcare intervention and it, severely, and it can severely impact um, the patient. Um, so, uh, so we're going to see the, the healthcare process very um, transparently. Um, we're also going to see the problem with our lack of first principles models and even um, how to manage the situation when we have somewhat first principles models. Um, and, uh, and then how animal models can help us understand and push uh, biology, mathematical biology forward. So um, ventilator basics, the primary vent, uh, variables in ventilation our pressure, volume, tidal volume, which is the total amount of volume that goes into your lungs in a single breath, flow, which is the rate at which it's the derivative of volume, it's the rate at which airflow goes in, um, PEEP, which is the, the baseline pressure um, holding your lungs open. So that's effectively the ventilator push, puts pressure, positive pressure into your lungs to keep your lungs um, from collapsing. And then uh, ventil a bunch of ventilator controls. So ventilators generally can induce um, what's called ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, in the early days of mechanical ventilation, they killed a lot of people with this accidentally. They still kill a lot of people with it um, accidentally. Um, and generally, what happens is that you over you uh, you think of your lungs as balloons. You can put too much um, uh, volume into them, kind of blowing them up. You can put too much pressure into them, and you can stress them out in various ways with ventilation. Um, in particular, ventilators aren't always in sync with the human. Um, so you can imagine if you breathe in and the ventilator is trying to breathe out, that can cause damage. Um, there's an event called a double trigger event where the ventilator, the ventilator um, can operate in two modes. It can just run or it can trigger breaths when it thinks you're trying to breathe. If it double triggers you, for example, so it gives you, it, it um, delivers a breath and then it delivers a breath before you've um, before you breathed out, it can almost double the amount of volume that you uh, that you get, which, as you can imagine, uh, imagine you're sitting there and uh, you have your lungs are filled up with twice the volume that they're normally filled up with. You can really do a lot of damage pretty quickly that way. So um, so there's ventilator dyssynchrony is a big problem, um, and generally the clinical goals of maximizing op uh, oxygenation and protecting the lungs are in conflict with each other. Um, you can oxygenate, oxygenate the lungs really well and destroy them in like 10 minutes. So, um, so at any rate, this is, uh, this is kind of the, the overall situation. The physiology, um, you can think of it as, uh, this is a picture of the human. This is from the Bates mo lung modeling book. Um, there's the breathing, uh, there's your esophagus and then the, the lungs and the lungs have these little alveoli. Uh, to first order the way we model this is effectively with a balloon, with a spring. So there's air going in and then there's a single compartment. And then we can split that compartment into many, many, many compartments called uh, multi-compartment models um, for trying to, uh, trying to model uh, situations where we have many. I think we lost him. Hopefully he'll be back in a sec. It's not on our end, right? I don't believe so. <clears throat> we'll give him a minute or two.
Next time, we should probably ask for a phone number for our speakers because you will probably never realize that we're not there anymore. <laughs> well, if he's been bumped out of Zoom, hopefully he realizes. Yeah, okay, that might do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Welcome back. All right. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. I have no idea what happened, actually. Yeah, some break in the internet connectivity somewhere. All right, let's see here. Um, no, let's see. <clears throat> let's see, am I sharing? Okay, here we go. All right, so, mm -hmm. so we can have these multi -compart single compartment, multi compartment models. Um, so this this is a great it's a great construction. Um, there's generally a problem. The single and two compartment models are too simple to, re to represent uh, physiology and disease processes. And they're really too simple to represent the physiology and the patient ventilator interactions. And I'll show you um, examples of that. And the multi-compartment models, um, we get back to this identifiability problem. They're hopelessly, they're, they run considerably slower than real time. I mean, like really considerably slower. And, um, and they're wildly non-identifiable, meaning that it's very, very difficult to estimate anything about the lung structure and the lung spatial structure with these models. And you kind of have to do that to have them um, work. So um, our solution to this is to, is to come up with a model. It's effectively some kind of a, it's a hybrid model. So we begin with model, with model equations for normal pressure and volume. And then we talk to the physiologists and the, and the clinicians, and we look at the various signal deformities due to ventilator dysynchrony and damage. And we, adjust, we add terms to the model that adjust, that allow us to bend the, uh, the, model, uh, the model waveform according to that pathophysiology. So we effectively have this hybrid model that's a mix of, mathemat of mechanistic physiology and non-mechanistic physiology that's a function of what uh, clinicians and physiologists believe are effectively bulk parameters of, of damage and, and dyssynchrony. And um, here we can see sort of some data. So this is, this is human data um, where we can see effectively, this is uh, the, at the beginning and at the end, this is, or no, this is mouse data. So at the beginning, the mouse is healthy. At the end, the mouse is not. Um, and we can see that the model um, is able to reproduce the data pretty well. Um, here's a volume waveform, a pressure waveform. This is a, a single breath. This is flow, which is a derivative of volume. And this is the PV loop, which um, pulmonologists care about. Um, the, the healthy means that this is nice. This is almost a square. Um, it's not bent in any weird ways. You're gonna see them bent in a bunch of weird ways in a second. And it's nice and big. So that means that the lungs are in compliance with the ventilator. So the lungs are breathing the way they should be breathing. Um, so it turns out that even in uh, even for when we when we estimate for people, the uh, the damage informed model, which is what we're calling our model, compared to the any of the single compartment models we can uh, come up with, um, this is for a sequence of breaths. This is the mean square error, and what we see is is that the damage informed model generally outperforms the the single compartment models by about a factor of three. Um, and this is for a human um, without any dyssynchrony. Okay, so this is the this is um, mean square error, right? And this is red is the single compartment model, and green is the um, the new model. So um, now here's the actual here here a real comparison with the synchrony and without the synchrony. So here's the here are dyssynchronous breaths in a person, and what we can see here is that the the single compartment model is the dashed line. And the single compartment model just can't represent the physiology, the, the ventilator human interaction. Um, so here's where we see the, um, the, the shortcoming of the single compartment models. Um, and it's, you can see that they're both sort of okay with the synchrony, um, but they're much worse uh, when, they're, when there's the synchronous uh, breaths. And effectively what happens is, um, including the disease process in the modeling really matters. Of course, you know, another option would be to model, uh, develop a full model of the ventilator, um, which is a, a hopeless, well, for us, it's hopelessly complicated, but, you know, 
I say go at it if you're willing to try it. Um, but uh, what we see is as damage and dyssynchrony increase, the single compartment model performs increasingly worse and the damage informed loan model remains accurate. So this is kind of where this is going. If you exclude the healthcare process, um, the worse the, the, the model, the standard models work. And it, unfortunately it's in those, uh, those circumstances that we want the information um, the most uh, uh, desperately. So, um, and here what you can say, um, uh, you see that here's, uh, this is mouse and this is human. Um, this is human. And remember I said that there were different compliance measures. So here, um, right, uh, yellow or um, uh, blue, blue is uh, at the beginning of the ICU stay, um, uh, brown is at the end of their ICU stay. So you can see they went through kind of a, a bad uh, situation because their loan volume was decreased, but their compliance is still okay. You have nice shape as opposed to over here, you can see what um, severely damaged lungs look like. Um, so, uh, the, the, instead of looking like a nice box, it looks very smashed. Um, but effectively the point of this is, is that what you want to do to try to validate the models is you take a mouse model and you put the mouse in the same situation as the human is, and then you estimate the same model in the, on the mouse and the human. And, um, we can't cut apart humans lungs or do anything drastic to humans, of course, because we're, um, not sadists. So, but we can do that to mice. And so what we can do is we can try to understand what uh, signatures in the model do the most damage. And I'll just give you an example of why this is a problem. So say the person has a lot of, say the person is breathing, but they have a lot of dyssynchrony. So there's a lot of events that are causing damage with the, with the ventilator. One option that clinicians have is to paralyze the patient. So they can give, give a neuromuscular blockade and now the patient's diaphragm stops. So now the ventilator is doing all of the work. Okay, so um, now they're not gonna be desynchronous from the ventilator, so they won't ever cough and have you know, air being forced in when they're trying to breathe out or something like this. However, when your diaphragm opens your lungs and air goes in, that is a much less damaging um, ventilation uh, strategy than having air forced into your lungs and forcing your lungs open, which stresses them out. So in other words, when you paralyze a person, that also causes damage. So the question really becomes which um, mode is the least damaging for the person to try to keep them alive. And to know that you have to know really specifically what's causing the damage and when and to do that, really the only way to get at it is to estimate the model in the, the mouse and the human in like situations, and then um, cut apart the mouse and try to figure out what's happening with their lungs. So that's kind of where we're trying to head with this to try to minimize ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, so uh, some key points, so that's, that's more or less it. Um, so some key points, um, the discipline of evaluating models with data um, substantially alters how we develop data. Um, Given data that we have, most models are ill-posed and, um, and are not identifiable. So if we just admit that, that opens up a huge world for modeling and for inference. Um, we of course uh, see very, very uh, high, uh, severe impacts of the now old dynamics misfit problem where we optimize relative to a metric, but it gives us very bad, dynam uh, very bad dynamic representation. Um, so uh, that uh, probably um, inter, uh, interjecting machine learning or uh, um, into that problem will help. Um, different dynamics have different impacts, even in the same modeling structure, different applications. Um, human physiologic data is a mix of all of, all of uh, healthcare process, disease and physiology um, processes. Um, yeah, system physiology, we, we don't have uh, first principles, so we have to find up methods to deal with it. Um, and uh, limited human measurement can sometimes be supplemented with animal models. Of course, nobody really likes using animal models, but um, you spend a day in an ICU and you might have a, a, you're gonna probably accept the fact that we use animals models once in a while. So um, at any rate, open problems are mostly have to do with severe identifiability failure, things like this, um, exploration of machine learning and data assimilation um, expansion into new physiologic settings, um, rank one theory for delay dynamical systems, parameter initialization is a problem that we don't really know how to solve very well. 
Um, and I showed you how we broke it, but we don't know how to fix it. Um, uh, inference with severe non-stationarity, um, DA built for delay dynamical systems. Um, and then uh, eventually maybe a Shannon-like sampling theorem for linear and nonlinear um, Kalman filters. So that's it. Thank you guys so much. Here's a bunch of papers and I'd like to thank the National Library of Medicine for money. Um, so uh, that's, that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, I hope it, I hope it was targeted okay. I, I could have made it a lot more mathematical or I could have made it a lot more physiological. I'm not exactly sure. But, um, I, th I think in the middle worked well for me. Uh, I think Leon Glass has a question. Oh. Yeah, so thanks very much. I, I don't have one question. I have dozens of questions. <laughs> that was really interesting. Can I ask one from the first part and one from the second part? Absolutely. So, so for the first part, uh, I'm aware that there are continuous glucose monitors that people are using now from Dexcom, yep. maybe other places also. And it wasn't clear to me why, you know, why that wasn't being done in the emergency rooms. Maybe then not into that. And then also in your simulations, it wasn't clear when you were doing the simulations, were you doing, uh, trying to compute when you were comparing the model with the data, I assume you, you're using the past and then predicting to some time in the future, but it wasn't clear exactly how far in the future. Oh, we uh, predict to the next data point. Which is how, which is what's the time interval of that? Um, so roughly an hour. Uh-huh. And what an about hour. the data? The yeah, so Dex, yeah, so there are a bunch of them. Dex comes are the best. Um, their standard of care for people with type one diabetes. Um, they're trying to start using them in the ICU. There are some ICUs um, because uh, with COVID, um, the management was so difficult. Some ICUs have gotten them, um, but they haven't been approved for that. It would be lovely if they if they were. Um, from our perspective, it would just help because we'd have uh, higher fidelity data, we still wouldn't have insulin, but having the CGM data would help a lot. Um, but they're, they, generally, I think the reason is because they have, they're expensive, they're invasive, and um, they're not approved. But I okay. think people are trying to get them approved in ICU settings. Um, yeah. In the type two setting, you know, that, which is 90, type two diabetes, that's 95% of people with diabetes. Um, you know, it, it's going to take a lot to, to um, yeah, it's going to take a lot to get that to work in that setting. But in the ICU setting, I hope that within 15 years or 10 years, they'll be there. Um, and I work with some people who've been trying them and trying to use them in some of the worst patients. Um, but it's, you know, it's hard to get, medicine's very conservative and it's hard to convince them to spend more money on another monitor to do a thing. Um, but it'd be great, I think. Can I ask a question about the second half? Absolutely. So, so uh, we, we were interested in this problems of synchronization of respiration to a mechanical ventilator a long time ago and even published a study uh, in people. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I am. I've, but, yeah, I've read a lot of your papers. My understanding at that time was they generally tried to hyperventilate the patients to avoid the situation of the fighting of the ventilator. Yep. And, or if that, you know, if they couldn't hyperventilate then they would paralyze the patients. Yep. So, but in your models, number one is, are they still doing that? It, at that time, it seemed to me that everything was very ad hoc the way they, Oh, just yeah. the ventilators, and I'm, 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 I find it interesting to hear that you're saying, I think that it's very ad hoc now the way they adjust the ventilators also. So I wonder if you could comment on oscillations in the model and also whether the patients are typically uh, in a state where they can fight the ventilator. Yes, yeah, so that's a very good, so a couple of things so first of all, so two things. So one, I don't, 
when they started with mechanical ventilation, um, they didn't have ventilators that were that had triggers that had patient triggers. So now all like you know they have dozens of modes and they can be pressure control and volume control and all these things. But excuse me, the most common mode is to be pressure controlled with a with a um, with a patient trigger. So the mm -hmm. ventilator tries to detect when the patient breathes in, and then it it kind of follows yeah. the patient. So that's the most common p uh, ventilator mode. And um, one of the problems with the mouse models is that they don't they don't have patient uh, mouse triggered ventilators. They just have pumps. But um, so what they tried to do, um, as far as the so there are these protocols now, patient uh, uh, ventilator protocols. Um, ARDS, ARDSNET, so acute respiratory distress syndrome net is one of them. Um, and I think the new one is the, the rose petal protocol or something where they are, where effectively empirically, they're trying to figure out what are the mechanic, what's this protocol for setting up a ventilator that minimizes damage. And so um, they call these long protective uh, protocols and they're effectively they're kind of like linear controllers, but you know, again, on a piece of paper. So the clinician looks at it on a piece of paper and goes, okay, well do this and then do this and then do this. And um, they're, they're, it turns out they're somewhat hard to implement. So if you're in an academic med medical hospital, they're probably pretty good at it. And if you're not, they're probably not. So adherence to these protocols is low, um, but this is so, in other words, I think most places it's somewhat ad hoc still, um, but they are trying to reduce the ad hocness with these protocols. But the protocols are hard to use. And what those what you what you can see, Leon, is even in patients who are going in for surgery who have no problems at all, they're going in for like a kidney surgery or something. Um, the lung protective protocols help them uh, because effectively what happens is often they set the ventilators up where they, um, they deliver too much volume because that's the easiest thing to control to oxygenate the patient. So, um, but yeah, I've definitely read your papers on it. I've, you know, okay, all the way back to like set the science paper in 79 or whatever. So, um, but yeah, so it's a, I think it's a nice time because they have a lot of, um, clinical, they're working on trying to, to refine these protocols and they're really thinking about ventilator induced lung injury. And so if we can come up with a way of calculating what we think the damage is, then they can um, try to fix the, some of these protocols. But there's also space for control theory because the protocol is effectively a controller. Um, but right now it's implemented on a piece of paper. Um, so it doesn't get used very well in most places. Also, it's a completely different controversial mess in pediatrics. And a lot of pulmonary docs think that they know better than the protocol. And so they go off into their, you know, their secret sauce that may or may not work. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Very good. It's nice to see you again. Other questions? I do have one, and maybe a bit naive. Do you, uh, if you're trying to implement some of the models in the ICU for glucose control, are they, are they, uh, do you get different results for for the people who had type two diabetes when they came into the ICU versus people who didn't, or for the type one diabetics, for that matter? So we've stayed away from type one. That's mm -hmm. a whole different protocol and a whole different set of models and. Um, for that, what people are working on is putting the artificial pancreas or beta cell structure in the ICU. Um, that hasn't been working so well because um, they don't account for all of the hormones that they put into people and anti-inflammatories that mangle the model structure. Hmm. So, but yes, uh, when we, we initially excluded type two diabetics, um, cause they're, they're about maybe eight or 9% of the population. Um, so we initially excluded them, but yes, the models do show up. They're act, what turns out is they're much more difficult to manage. Mm. Um, and they're much less predictable. And most people with type two don't have, also aren't on insulin. 
Um, but what you do see is the oscillatory behavior of a type one person or of a type two person, the oscillations are much wider. And so they're more likely to go into a hypoglycemic event. So yeah, they are, they are uh, more complicated and more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and what they were seeing, one of the reasons why people are worried um, with COVID and type two is that what they're seeing is it seems like people are making a transition over their ICU state into the diabetic state, um, especially if they have severe COVID. And it seems like sometimes between 10 and 20 people are going to leave with type 2 diabetes who didn't have it. Um, we're, we have a um, study going on right now trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But you see, you're just seeing effectively endothelial damage that's driving them into this new state. Um, and those people are more, were, um, we did, weren't using any models for them, but we know that they were more difficult to manage. Right. I'm just getting, keeping it on the time here. I think perhaps we may have to wrap it up unless there's one more burning question from anybody. I mean, I had a question. So the models are not from first principles. Right. You don't have enough data. You can make these really complicated models with too many parameters and you can get really good fits with them, but you can no longer run as fast as real time. So you get left behind. Um, I'm kind of comparing that to a situation of a pure mathematician who has his bag of tools and he proves his theorems, always doing the steps in the same order. How do you navigate through this, Dave? How do you decide what's tractable, how you're going to do things? What, what are your guiding principles to actually get to these answers because i'm i'm worried that as a student looking at this they're going to just throw their hands up in the air and say i can't i can't make head nor tails of this where do i even start yeah so the um i think that's a very good question so i think this is one of the places where it's very helpful to have um the application helps guide that decision and that understanding so um Lots of times we have, there's information. So you don't, you're not necessarily trying to perfectly reproduce the system. You're trying to reproduce it well enough so that you can do something with it. And in along the line, you hope that you get better and better at in um, getting the, system, the modeling to work. So you have to, I mean, it's a nice problem because you have a lot of different pieces of machinery you have to work with. So you start with the model, you try to reduce it as much as you can then you start trying to estimate it with data. Then it's a disaster. Then you ask people, well, what's important information to know about this model? Maybe I don't need to estimate every piece of it. Maybe I need to estimate certain bits of it. And then you focus on those bits. And usually when you reduce enough, you get to something that's, that's you start getting positive traction and then you begin ba building back out from there. So um, it helps a lot to have it helps a lot to have people to talk to who are trying to use um, the information from the data that you have, because you see how much worse of a position they're in. Because they're saying, all right, well, all we have is the data and we're trying to make this decision that might impact this person's life. And you say, okay, well, that's a terrible problem to have. So maybe I can help with this little bit. And so um, it, that bit of realism helps keep you sane when you're, as you say, look at this gigantic model and uh, it's, it, nothing seems to work. And you just kind of keep chopping the model down and keep chopping you know, your goal down until you get something. And then you sort of start moving out from there. Um, that's kind of, does that help? Yeah, that helps. Um, helps me anyway. Very good. I mean, we end up, it ends up that we're going to end up probably having to use a bunch of machine learning and data assimilation to try to get the models into the right place. Um, so, but, you know, which is a lot of cool, involves a lot of cool mathematics, but. Um, Lots to work on. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think we, we should probably wrap it up here. Uh, I would like to sort of express a, a warm thank you for a really wonderful presentation. There will be um, uh, <clears throat> a recording available um, at some point. Uh, so thank you so much. Okay. And um, yes, students, please just stay on the on the Zoom um, with Dr. Albers, but we can take a couple of minutes break if you need one.
So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Thank you so much for having